Hey guys, it's Graham. What's cracking? Shout out to Red Chungus for this one. He watched the Something Wicked This Way Comes video and he DM'd me and we got to talking about the audio edition that I listened to. And it turns out it's the same one he listened to back in the day. And we ended up going down a rabbit hole and I ended up having to work backwards from this. I was like, man, I got a couple of things that I want to say about this now that I've, I've remembered a whole bunch of stuff he brought up. So if you do a search on Audible for Something Wicked This Way Comes, there's a, a narration by, I don't even know this, this narrator's name. It must be a more recent recording, and sometimes they do that with really popular books. Like, you'll do a search for it, and, okay, here's, like, three versions of it. The one that I listened to was narrated by Stefan Rudnicki, who, he's, like, one of the top narrators that I've listened to. My two favorites are Bronson Pinchot and Tim Gerard Reynolds. Stefan Rudnicki has a massively deep, gravelly voice, and it just commands your attention. Uh, the flip side of that is if he's narrating young teen boy characters, it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm losing some of the immersive quality here, but him just narrating straight up, he's great. Uh, the Stefan Rudnicki edition of Something Wicked is a, a dual book, though, after Something Wicked ends, there's a short story attached to the end of it called A Sound of Thunder. And uh, Chungus asked me if I'd seen that movie, and I was like, what movie? And then, it, like, you've, have you ever seen a movie that was so bad? What the heck is this guy doing? That was synchronicitous. That you you basically, like, put it out of your memory until, like, somebody says the MK Ultra code word, and it all comes rushing back, and you're like, ah, that was terrible. That's what this movie was. But it caught me off guard how bad it was because this movie came out in, I want to say 2005. And for most of that year, I was still on my mission in Spain. I wasn't watching movies. But if I was walking around and I'd see billboards or posters for movies at, at places, I would just kind of mentally catalog like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll see it when I get home. And there was this... Uh, poster for this this movie that kind of had a cool look it was called el sonido del trueno the, the sound of thunder and uh a friend of mine there in alcoy saw it and he was describing it to me and basically like it was this time travel thing these guys go back in time and one of them accidentally steps on a butterfly and that tweaks the entire rest of the future and uh they've got to they've got to save it before like time is annihilated I thought, that sounds kind of familiar turns out that this is a, an idea that has been riffed on a lot in sci-fi and I'm not sure, but I have a theory here and this is what I was trying to work out with Chungus. He didn't know either. This might be the first popular instance of this type of story. You heard the saying, if a butterfly beats its wings in China, it causes a hurricane on the other side of the world. It's this, this butterfly effect, this, this uh, small thing leads to big thing type theory. And it, it's just played to uh, a natural but very, very extreme extrapolation of that in this story. However, the original story that Bradbury wrote was way shorter and simpler than what was done with this movie. Basically, in the future, like mankind has industrialized the planet to the point of almost all living things are destroyed except for mankind. The only wild animals left are, well, I guess like the most recent uh, wild animal that died was like a crocodile in captivity or something. And so if people want to see live animals or even hunt live animals, they've got to go pay for expensive time travel tourism trips. And uh, there are obviously like laws around time travel and stuff, and this is dangerous, but this one company has figured out uh, a, t a place in prehistoric times when a T-Rex died of, uh, I guess, natural causes, and then was, like, buried by a volcanic explosion about five minutes later. And this place figures out, like, hey, we can keep going back to this point in time, and we can kill this T-Rex an infinite amount of times with time travel tourists because it's not going to disrupt anything in the time flow. So perfect. They, they dress up in, you know, Halo-style armor with super future laser guns and uh, they open up their time portal and there's a path. There's like this crystalline glass path. And if they walk on it, they, they stay on the path. Nothing that they do moving around in the past will, um, will affect anything. 
Well, something goes wrong on one of these trips and a guy steps on a butterfly and it ends up coming back to the future with him after they shoot this T-Rex. And somehow that small action ends up completely destroying and altering the future. And like when they show back up in the future, there's like mutant spider baboon thingies that are killing everybody and invading the, uh, the future. And like there are these constant time boom echoes that change things in increasingly drastic ways to the point where people are devolving, plants are taking over cities and crushing buildings. And they're like, oh crap, like we got to get the time machine back up and running and go back and fix this. And in terms of like the budget and the acting and all of that, like this is a 2 a.m. sci-fi channel movie. Like the, the dialogue is bad. The acting is hammy. The black dude dies first. Like it, it's every bad trope. Like this movie was terrible. I, I think I bought a cheap DVD of it at Walmart once for five bucks. And I'm like, I overpaid. <laughs> uh, but I did remember listening to the story and just not really grabbing that much out of the, uh, the Ray Bradbury short story itself. It was only like a half an hour. Uh, he was really just putting forth a, a concept. And then whoever wanted to make this movie, they took that and, and developed it way farther than that. But they must have had a very limited budget. They didn't spend a whole lot of it on uh, writing or the cast or production or whatever. And they ended up kind of pushing out just this, this terrible movie. And I would have had no clue that it was that same thing, that it was based on a Ray Bradbury story if, uh, if it hadn't been attached to that audiobook of Something Wicked that I read 15 years ago. Obviously, other people have played with this idea in sci-fi. Uh, I think in comics, for example, the most famous idea would be uh, the Flashpoint story, in DC Comics, where the Flash tries to go back in time to save his mom, but the act of doing that just causes a whole bunch of things to go sideways. Um, there was an animated version of that comic, which was pretty good. And then they adapted a lot of pieces of it for the Flash movie that came out last summer. It's him trying to go back in time and change one thing and, and it throws everything else into chaos. Um, shoot, even the, uh, the Cursed Child, the Harry Potter play, does kind of the same thing. Like somebody messes with a time turner to try to save Cedric Diggory or something. And uh, it just completely destroys time. Uh, I remember reading that and thinking like, okay, this is a similar concept and it's, it's kind of cool as like a member berry thing to go down the rabbit hole and think like, oh, well, what would have happened if this had gone that way or whatever? And like Harry's son is trying to fix it all. Um, but I think the idea was put forth by JK Rowling for that one, but it was obviously like written and fleshed out by other writers. Um, I thought it was fine. It didn't really tread any new ground and you could tell that it was her world, but it was somebody else pulling puppet strings on it. Uh, I guess the larger Harry Potter fandom is really against the cursed child. I don't know. I don't care, but it, it's a, uh, it's a version of that same idea of like, Oh, we went back in time and we changed one thing and everything else went nuts. I think my favorite riff on this is actually from a Simpsons Halloween Treehouse of horror episode where I, I can't even remember what the, uh, the mechanism is like oh, Homer's toaster goes haywire and every time he uses it or something, he ends up in a different timeline where things are weird and mostly unlikable, except for one where uh, he, he ends up like he goes back to dinosaur times, he kills a dinosaur and then like he goes back to the future and things are changed. Anyway, in one of these alternate timelines, he shows up, he's rich. He doesn't have to work. All of the in-laws that he hates are dead. And, uh, he sits down to eat and he goes, uh, he goes, oh man, everything's perfect here. And he goes, uh, Marge, pass me a donut. And she goes, donut, what's a donut? And Homer freaks out. He's like, no. And he goes and fires up the time machine again. And like right after he leaves, donuts start falling from the sky. And Marge is like, oh, it's raining again. <laughs> like, Homer had found his, his perfect Nirvana place. And he, uh, he abandoned it because he, he freaked out just like 10 seconds too early. But it's an idea that has been done in a lot of different properties and handled by a lot of different writers. But it's possible that this by Ray Bradbury, The Sound of Thunder, was the first version of this idea to really hit uh, the, the mainstream. If, if there's one that's older than this, older than the 1960s, let me know. 
just funny little things. So anyway, if you've read the short story, let me know. If you've seen that movie, gosh, I couldn't even tell you the name of any actors in it. <laughs> but it, it'd be worth it to watch it with a couple of your friends and just roast it. Let me know what you think. Till next time, drive safe. See you out there.